Hello, my name's Ian Seeger from Pilot Career News. On the 6th and 7th of November, we held our very first virtual edition of Pilot Careers Live. We streamed over 30 different seminars with 60 speakers. There were two days packed full of great information. Of course, we recorded everything and you're about to watch one of the videos from the, from, from the, from the event. Um, before you do, I just want to thank our sponsors, Bose, Alsim, Entro, and of course, Pulis. Without them and without the exhibitors, it wouldn't be possible. The exhibitor pages are still live, so feel free to head on over there. Go to www.pilotcareerslive.com and click through to the exhibitors. There's loads of information, loads of downloads, all sorts of great stuff there for you. Anyway, enjoy the video, and if you find it useful, really appreciate it if you click subscribe on our YouTube channel. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello and welcome back to PCL TV Studio 2. Um, we've shortly got a presentation coming up from Carl Haslam which is all about the MP MPL, past, present, future, all sorts of myths, debunks and everything else. Um, before we move on to that, I just wanted to explain, uh, firstly I need to apologise a little bit because we're running a little bit late, um, but we'll do our best to catch up. After this session, there's a Q&A session, or maybe it's, uh, anyway, there's a Q&A session a bit later, um, where we'll deal with all sorts of questions. We've got a bunch of really good uh, presentations later on this afternoon, some extra panels, some stuff on ground score, some stuff of UPRT with uh, Mark Greenfield, which I'm sure you'll enjoy. Um, then at the end of the day, we'll have another Q&A session and a wrap up. And I wanted to mention the wrap up. We've had a few questions uh, about stuff that doesn't easily fit in uh, with, the, with the panel discussions, but, but questions that may be answered tomorrow. But anyway, what we're going to do is we'll do our very best to answer those later on. Um, we obviously won't be here all night reading through them, but we'll try and clump them together to get to some of the questions. Um, so uh, bear with us and uh, join, us, well, join us throughout the day, clearly. There's nothing else to do, is there? Um, but if, if you don't, if you can't make it throughout the day, come and see us later on this afternoon uh, when we're dealing with that. All of the stuff will be uploaded over the next couple of days and it'll be available on the website uh, so you'll be able to see it. So if you miss something, that's a bit of a problem. Anyway, uh, I think we're just about ready for Carl. Um, Carl, thank you very much for being so patient. How are you doing? Very much. Not a problem at all. Excellent. Excellent. And I believe you have a presentation for us. I do indeed. Uh, I'll share my screen and then we're ready to go. As soon as you've shared your screen, it can be over to you. Great. Do you have that now then? All right. Absolutely. Great stuff. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for inviting me here today. As uh, Ian said, we're running slightly late. But I'm going to blame Anthony Pettiford for that because he does like to talk too much, to be honest. Uh, he did also send me a kind, um, a kind um, request if I wanted to borrow his cushion so everybody could see me today. But um, thank you very much for that, Anthony. I think I'll be fine. So I'm just going to give you a quick update of what the flight plan is going to be today. So today, just a quick update about my background, about why I'm here, and a little bit about the history of MPL, the past, the present, and where we're going to hopefully take it. But really, I want to also focus on some of the good, the bags, and the ugly, and we can talk about the gorilla along the way. It's going to take around about 20 minutes of presentation, and I think we're allowing a Q&A towards the end as well. So please feel free to ask some questions and we can hopefully give you the answers. So first of all, uh, my name's Carl Haslam. I'm a former BA320 captain, been in airline operations for around about 20 years, instructor and examiner on the Airbus. Currently, I left BA around about 10 years ago. And that's when I started getting involved in MPL training. And I've been fortunate now to be involved in MPL training for around about 10 years, um, and which I've been involved in the development, the implementation, the delivery, the instructor training, the standardization of MPL training throughout the world. And I work very closely with a company called HATCO, which is a company called Harms Aviation. They were the company that we are widely, uh, widely uh, recognized as actually developing MPL programs through the development of competency-based training and assessment. On top of that now, I'm a consultant with IATA and I specialized in evidence-based training. Linked to that is also competency-based training. And also latterly, I've been working with Karen and Stuart and the rest of the brilliant team at Resilient Pilot, who are here now, foundation support and develop and help all those uh, pilots that are displaced and uh, in the difficult parts of the world now due to the uh, COVID pandemic. Great, so let's have a look, little look at the, the past. So I mentioned Dita. Back in around about 1985, uh, Dieter used to be the former head of training for Lufthansa. 
and he realized that actually pilot training hadn't really evolved. It hadn't really changed in years. We were still training for tasks that aren't really relevant in the modern world. We were still on an inventory based system where you did a, a number of hours and then you got issued a license, you did some more hours, you got some more licenses. But this didn't really necessarily help or support the individual to develop the skills and the competencies required to actually perform to a high standard in the commercial operation. So we started to look at what we needed to do to improve and change this environment. And he looked at other analogies. He sort of said, well, actually, what about dinghy sailing? How does that work? Well, yeah, absolutely. But if you want to become a sailor, then you're going to start in a dinghy. It gives you some really interesting principles of primacy. You understand the weather, be that wind, be that thunderstorms, be that waves, tide. You really understand the weather fly, driving a, a dinghy around the seas. But actually, if your ambition is actually to become a captain of a cruise ship, does that really prepare you for that job? Is it really the same job? Yes, similar platforms, but actually fundamentally quite different roles. And if you move that forward now to sort of pilot training, we spend a lot of time in light aircraft, punching holes in the sky, developing our, our skills and our competencies. And that's absolutely correct. We need to develop those principles of primacy. Those skills that we learn whilst flying light aircraft are crucial to, to operations in the line. But I think we need to be mindful of what those skills that we're learning are. In effect, we always thought it was going to be the psychomotor skills, the stick of nutter. But actually, as we're becoming more data driven and we understand what's happening with pilot training, we realize it's not necessarily the psychomotor skills that we're training in light aircraft flying. It's more the human factors. There's nothing wrong with that individual going off on their own and getting scared, getting lost, learning a little bit about themselves, learning a little bit more about communication on their own developing solid situational awareness and decision making, all of which they can do on that, on that platform. But if we think we're fundamentally going to train that individual pilot on a light aircraft to have the same psychomotor stick and rudder skills that are required to handle the bigger jets, then I think we need to look at how we train pilots. And that's really the sort of principles of where NPL development came from. And if we look at some of those, the platforms, so that's a generation one aircraft. And by generation one, I mean an aircraft that's got no autopilot, no water throttle, no EFIS, limited backup systems, and is very much a pilot stick and rudder problems. Well, the problems they had on that initial aircraft, on that generation one, compared to the, what is there, an A350 generation four aircraft, is significantly different. Generation one, it was primarily technical, things broke. Things fell off, things didn't work. So we needed to train the pilots to deal with those dynamic individual tasks, those engine failure problems that they had that was continual within that environment. But now if we move that forward into the modern world, an A350, there are over two and a half thousand different issues that that aircraft can develop. The pilot training pilot plane platform is not or cannot train an individual to remember or deal with two and a half thousand different problems. So how do we deal with that? How do we train a pilot to actually fundamentally deal with the unforeseen? It's been commonly referred to for many years as a black swan. How many times do we see a black swan? Well, actually, very rarely. Hence, we need to you can't train it in the simulated environment. But you do need to develop a set of competencies that the pilot therefore can deal with any, any eventuality, no matter what that is. And a really good example of that might be the Qantas 380 from a few years ago. They had, I think, 65 different drills going off at the same time, most of which were actually counter to some of the other drills. But through fundamentally brilliant leadership, good communication, and good technical knowledge and application of procedures, they managed to solve a very, very difficult and complex problem. One that they could never train for, they just had to deal with, with competencies. So here we are in this very complex world, this highly dynamic, changing, unforeseen platform every day on the, op on the line is different. And here we are now looking to develop the fundamental skills and competencies of that pilot. So what's the solution? Well, Dieter and the team developed the, the principle of competency-based training and assessment, whereby you don't try and, in, try and develop the individual task. We don't train to task. We train the competencies and therefore develop the individual's competence to deal with anything that may be thrown at them. 
So in summary of what is competency-based training, we move away from task. We don't need to worry about the task. We worry about developing the individual competence. We have a grading system and a grading matrix which reflects that, that makes actually grading MPL simpler. It makes it more focused on the individual's training needs and developing the individual's tailored training solution, whereby it's not about the number of hours you've got, it's about achieving the right level of competence and everybody will develop at different rates and different times within the training programs. Some individuals might find certain aspects simpler and therefore they can steam through that element of the course, where others might find that same element quite complex and need a little bit more time to develop the right level of competence. Threat and error management. Threat and error management is not a new concept. It underpins everything that we do within commercial aviation. Around about 90% plus of a commercial pilot's job is actually managing threats, the externals, and the errors, the things that we all make mistakes with. And that's human nature. We all make mistakes. But it's how we manage those threats and those errors that prevent us moving down that threat and error train, chain into the undesired aircraft state. And the way we look at that is the competencies, the set of nine individual competencies, which we've been discussed today already. They're your countermeasures to threat and error management. We use those to prevent threats, or I should say to, to anticipate and uh, mitigate the threats, to recognize and recover from any errors that we have. And that's what we're using our competency set to do those things. And overall, that allows us to have a complete and total systems approach to our flight training. So that was the past. Now let's look at where we are currently. So we are currently in a situation around the globe where we have over 6,500 MPL students. We've had nearly 4,000 MPL graduates, over 100 captains. And there are now 50 plus um, ATO MPL programs around the world. So this is a now a worldwide recognized program. There's lots of myths about this and I'll come on to those in, in a short time and, and we'll have a look at those in a little bit more detail. So what's the difference? Let's look at how MPL, for those that aren't familiar with the program, how MPL compares to a traditional platform. So if you look at CPLIR, a normal platform, and I'm not here to say that the CPLIR route is not a good route to pilot training, because it is. It's a very valid way to achieve a pilot's license. But if your ultimate goal is to become a commercial airline pilot, there are better ways to do that. An MPL route is, is, is the methodology is a superb way to get you onto the flight deck. But if you want to do single pilot operations or you would like to do PPL flying, then the CPL route is more than capable of providing that training to a very high standard. So I'm not here to say that that is not a way of pilot training because it is. Both routes have got superb validity and great training quality. But it's broken down into the simple routes. And I think other, other people on the panels have, talk, have talked about those. The ATPL theory is standard between the two platforms. Both ATPL theories do the same 14 subjects along the way. And then similar phases. You've got um, the solo route, the fun of flying. We could refer to that in other ways. It's, it's good to do the uh, individual solo route. The more complex multi-engine pilot and IR flying, finally up to your CPL and IR uh, rating towards the end of the course. You then get that, you get your license issued, which is brilliant. Everybody comes away with a CPLR, LI, CPLIR, frozen ATPL. From there, you'll go on and do some MCC, GRK, APS, MCC training, a type rating, finally go to base and line training. Now, this is principally where things begin to differ between the two training methodologies. Most of that training is single pilot ops, whereas actually it's only the latter, the smallest course, smallest part of the course, which is actually multi-crew pilot driven. And that's why it differs. So if we look at what is an MPL program, TK is the same, the theoretical knowledge, the six months in ground school, just the same. But then you move through four different phases. Core, that's light aircraft flying. That's in your single engined uh, piston aircraft uh, doing very similar maneuvers that you would do as part of your CPL route. But the focus now is really on the human factors, those principles that we can develop, that we can learn from, and that pilot can start to develop those core human factor training competencies. Then you'll move into the simulated environments. So the next three phases are all in flight simulators. And you complete at the end of those similar number of hours in, in effect, you end up with around about 240 hours of flight training, which is very comparable to a CPL and IR route. 
and they're the comparators. Some some people do link it quite the same, but it is quite different flight training. Other principles are very different. On conclusion of your advanced phase, you also then complete the licensed skills test exactly the same way as you would do within a type rating under normal CPAR, CPLIR route. At which point now, and I'll come to this a little bit later, you can have a license issued. That license will be restricted and it becomes unrestricted when you do base training. So in effect, you have a A320 or a Boeing 737 or a Dash 8 or an Embraer type rated MPL license that is exactly the same in law as exactly the same validity as a CPL license with an A320, Boeing 737, Q400 rating attached to it. They are exactly the same. Difference now is you've spent most of your time in a multi-career environment being trained for the job, job, being trained to become an airline pilot with that airline pilot mentality, that professionalism and that approach to flight training and operations. So just to recap, point to MPL. And the big difference is that we're trying to take you away from the single pilot ops and we're really moving you into the multi-pilot world, which is where your life will be as an airline pilot. So that's a little bit about the past, a little bit about the present. Now, where is MPL training going? So over the last few months with COVID, there's been some significant hurdles to jump with the MPL products in particular. Because um, generally the MPL has got to be tagged to an airline. The airline supports the process from the start. And the philosophy and idea behind that was it engenders the individual to that airline. It creates a connection between the two parts. It links flight training with airline operations like it's never been done before. But also it gets the mindset of that individual who's working to that operator's SOPs. It gets them really focused on moving into that airline. But actually we realized that there are some barriers to that. The airlines don't necessarily want to commit two years out. And we could be in a situation where we are now where some MPL cadets are left without a sponsor airline. So what we're looking now within HATCO and EASA and the, the, the uh, regulators is how we could actually improve that scenario. And the thinking is whether we can start to move towards a manufacturer's or a white tail MPL program where you wouldn't necessarily become tagged or sponsored until maybe the advanced phase, at which page then you'll, you'll start with generic Airbus SOPs and then move to specific operator SOPs as the program develops. And that's really what we're trying to do. So we can take all the brilliant parts of MPL, but actually therefore allow people and airlines and individuals choices and options and flexibility. But I think also we've now realized the benefits of delivering good competency-based training. In the fact that actually now regulations are gonna allow that same methodology to be used in other, in other training courses. So that will come down through the type rating, through the CPL, through the PPL. So we can start to use what we've learned and developed in, in competency-based training also throughout other training platforms. So here we go. There's been an awful lot of press over the last three, six, nine, 12 months around about MPL programs. And as I say, I've been, I've been privy and been fortunate to be involved in MPL for the last 10 years. And so these are some of the lines I've heard along the way. Microsoft pilot's license, you're not a real pilot until you've done a CPL course. And it goes on and on and on and on. And I just smile now because actually it doesn't matter. The CPL route is just as capable as becoming an MPL pilot. But if you want to become an airline pilot, train to become an airline pilot, in my opinion. And this to me was always uh, validated when I first started delivering MPL training or about nine, 10 years ago. I had two cadets in the front of the sim. I was in the advanced phase um, and we'd completed the learning objectives for that session. So I asked the two guys what they would like to do. They said, okay, Carl, give us something we've never seen before. Well, that's the principles of MPL. You're training for the unforeseen. You're developing competencies. So I looked at my smorgasbord of horrors on the instrument uh, instructor operating station, and it had a button that said lightning strike. Never seen this button before, didn't know what it did, thought we'd try it. So we roll down the runway, we, have a, we go past V1, the point of no return, and I hit lightning strike button. Massive bang, everything goes dark. All that the two pilots are left with now is a tiny standby ISIS, a standby instrument, and that's it. Super calm on the flight deck. Pilot monitoring calls rotate at the right point. The pilot flying, who's got this tiny instrument to work off now, 
rotates the aeroplane beautifully. Unfortunately, the lightning strike had hit the engine. We now had an uncontained fire. And just watching these two cadets, and there were just two cadets, then manage the flight deck was unbelievable. Super calm, fantastic leadership, great manual flying, great cooperation with this, between the two, negotiated with air control, traffic control, managed the technical problem brilliantly. And the, the climb got to around about 3,000 feet, formed a 180, and we were back on the runway in less than seven minutes. Now, I challenge a proficient line crew to have done it as effectively as those two individuals, cadets. And at that point, I started to realize that actually this is the way we should be looking to train airline pilots. It was exceptional. It was a super way of doing it. And on some of the myths now that have been going wrong, so all the pilots that have been going through flight training are saying that they are not going to be able to get a license. So um, Resilient Pilot and myself and the rest of the team with Karen and Stuart have been working very closely with the brilliant team at the CAA to actually come up with a solution. And this is also connected to all of the ATOs in the UK. Despite the negative press that the ATOs have been receiving, we know that they've been working tirelessly in the background with the authority, with Resilient Pilot, with the individuals to trying to achieve a solution to what is a very difficult um, situation. And with them all, with the operators included in that, in that three way as well, we've managed to come up, or the CA have um, achieved what they're going to call a, a relief pilot license, which is written down in law. So it's always been there. But this will enable an MPL pilot to complete their course, complete the LST, and then apply for this relief pilot restricted license, which in effect freezes it. Because from completing your LST normally, you've got six months to do base training, or you need to do that type rating section again. Well, this in effect freezes that license. It gives them time, therefore, to think. It also allows them flexibility. They could go off to a different operator. They could do a different type rating. It gives them time, space to do different things. And that's exactly the same as if you'd done this route as a CPL holder. We have some cadets who finished their type rating, completed the LST, and then the sponsoring airline also pulled out from their completion of the Because what, sorry? We lost the Zoom call. Hello, so I believe, uh, I believe that I'm live because the Zoom call has been lost, which is uh, interesting. So uh, I can see Zoom there. So can you hear me, Carl? I've, for some reason, we've lost the Zoom call and uh, people are left looking at me, which is a very, very poor substitute for them looking at you. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but I guess I'm, I'm kind of guessing. I can, still you, I can still hear you in my ear. So I'm going to ask a question, if I may. At the beginning, you, uh, you, you said you were going to address some kind of £3,000 gorilla, which I was kind of uh, interested in. Have I missed you addressing that? Or has that been addressed? Or has that come, was that the half-baked turkey? Or... Uh, You, uh, in, in your, uh, when you, at the beginning of your presentation, you said you were going to do past, present, future, good, bad, and ugly, and then you mentioned something about a £3,000 gorilla. Um, was that the reference to the half-baked turkey or something else? Unfortunately, you'll have to kind of tell me and I'll tell everyone else. We have in, in fact, in fact, you're, fact back. you're back. You're live. You're live. I'm back. You're live, which is much better. Thank you. Great. So here we are on the half-baked turkey. So there's lots of negative press around the gorilla in the myth, the half-baked, uh, the £3,000 gorilla. And the fact that all these myths around about NPL not being a real license, not being a valid way to pilot training, they are just that. And it comes down to the often ill-informed and ill-educated. And I spend a lot of my time working with not necessarily authorities and um, operators because they know NPL. They like NPL. They trust NPL. And to give you an example um, of 
I've just got lots of half baked. These are some of the quotes that I've had from both uh, operators and pilots that have flown with MPL pilots, live pilots who've flown with MPL trained pilots along the way. And it gives you real confidence. And one of the guys I was training a long time ago to be an MPL instructor, he said, they're just great. It's fantastic jumping online with an MPL trained pilot because it, you got a, it's as if you've got a really experienced first officer in the right hand seat rather than 200 hour cadet. And that's what we're really trying to push here. And therefore, the 300, 300 pound gorilla is really not the fact that people don't, that airlines and operators don't understand MPL. It's really individuals. And individuals are giving mixed messages out there saying that you're not a real pilot until you've done a CPL course. And that's just wrong. It's got exactly the same validity. The training methodology is absolutely bang up to date and the way we should be looking to train pilots um, and the way we should be moving through with pilot training. We should evolve. We should, we should not be super reactionary. We should evolve and actually learn from ourselves. And I think for Fantastic. myself, I'm going to say thank you very much. I think we've, I think we've, uh, we've run out of time and that's partly our fault for being a bit late. So I would like to apologise to you for that. But thank you for a fantastic presentation. I think clearly and looking at some of the comments that I was looking at live, there's a, there's a people are com conflating the, the MPL and the qualities of the MPL and what you can achieve with the MPL in terms of, in terms of training quality with some of the more uh, unfortunate instances that have been where people have, uh, clearly an MPL is tied to an airline and, and sometimes that's not always worked out well. Um, so it does come with its... Uh, um, with its challenges, obviously, but, but that's all about sharing the risk and not sharing the risk and understanding that. But certainly not to, to it, from everything I've known and everything, everyone I've spoken to, uh, to mix that element up with the quality of training would be, um, would be to not understand what the MPL is all about from a training point of view, not necessarily from a student, an individual student, an airline point of view, but as a concept. Great. Well, thank you very much for that, Carl, and uh, I look forward to talking to you again at some stage.